Inflation is now generally accepted as the best explanation for the isotropy and flatness of the universe. Its prediction of an early scale free spectrum of fluctuations has been spectacularly confirmed by recent observations of the microwave background. The appearance of Doppler peaks at small angular scales shows the fluctuations have correlations beyond the particle horizon of the hot Big Bang model. This rules out local processes, such as cosmic strings, because they would produce correlations only within the particle horizon. On the other hand, a period of exponential expansion in the early universe would remove the particle horizons and allow causal contact between regions that are widely separated now. The only alternative explanation of the Doppler peaks would be to suppose there were long-range correlations in the Big Bang established during some pre-Big Bang scenario, like the Ecterotic Universe. I will leave it to others to point out the flaws in the Ecterotic scenario. One problem is that one is chasing a moving target, because the theory seems to change every week. <laughs> Nevertheless, I don't expect the ectorotic universe will survive like the theory of inflation, which has been around 20 years. There have been various proposals as to how inflation started and ended. They all involve a scalar field, phi, with a potential, V. In the old inflation scenario, the universe was supposed to start with infinite temperature at the Big Bang singularity. As the universe expanded and cooled, phi was supposed to be trapped in a local minimum of E. The energy momentum tensor of this constant phi field would act like a cosmological constant and cause the universe to expand exponentially. However, the local minimum would be only a metastable false vacuum. It should decay to the true vacuum at the global minimum of E through a Coleman D. Lucia in Stanton. This consists of a bubble of the true vacuum surrounded by the false vacuum. The trouble was, if the bubble formation rate was high, the false vacuum would decay before there had been enough inflation. On the other hand, if the bubble formation rate was low, the bubbles would appear so far apart that the bubbles would never meet up and complete the decay of the false vacuum. To overcome this difficulty, 
the new inflation scenario was proposed. The idea was that the effective potential, V, would depend on temperature, and therefore on time in the early universe. It was still thought that a scalar field would be trapped in a local minimum. However, it was now supposed that the height of the barrier around the local minimum would decrease as the universe cooled. Eventually, the scalar field would quantum tunnel through the barrier and would then run down the hill to the global minimum of the potential. If the hill was not too steep, the scalar field would roll down the hill slowly in the interior of the bubble. The interior would expand almost exponentially by a large factor. Inflation would take place in a single bubble, and there was no need for different bubbles to join up as in old inflation. This was the new inflation proposal of Andrew Linda, which I heard when I saw him in Moscow in 1981. I realized there was something wrong. A bubble of the true vacuum would have been bigger than the Hubble radius, which was not possible. Instead, Ian Moss and I showed that the scalar field would stay constant in space. It would jump to the top of the barrier between the false vacuum and the true. The top of the barrier is an equilibrium position, but it is an unstable equilibrium. The scalar field would not remain sitting at the top of the hill, but would run down. Again, provided the hill was not too steep, there would be enough inflation to explain the isotropy and flatness of the universe. It might seem surprising that the scalar field should jump to the top of the barrier everywhere. The reason is that because of the horizon, D sitter effectively has a finite spatial size. This means that a constant scalar field is the tunneling configuration with least energy if the second derivative of the potential at the top of the barrier 
is fairly low. More precisely, all inhomogeneous modes of the scalar field have positive eigenvalues and are stable. It is only the homogeneous mode that is unstable. New inflation fell out of favor for various reasons. One was that although inflation is supposed to explain the initial conditions of the hot Big Bang model, it needed a fairly isotropic and flat hot Big Bang to start it off. Another was that thermal fluctuations would have been large and would have knocked the scalar field off the top of the hill. However, work I have done with Thomas Hertog at Cambridge indicates that the scalar field can still start naturally at the top of the hill, even without an early hot Big Bang stage. The usual approach to inflation is to assume some initial condition for the universe and evolve it forward in time. This could be described as a bottom-up approach to cosmology. It is an essentially classical picture because it assumes there is a single well-defined metric for the universe. By contrast, Hertog and I adopted a quantum approach based on the no-boundary proposal. This says that the amplitude for an observable, like the three metric on S, is given by a path integral over all metrics whose only boundary is S. It leads to a top-down view of the universe. The histories that contribute to the path integral depend on the observable being measured. There will be an amplitude for empty flat space, but it is not of much significance. By the weak anthropic principle, we are interested only in quantum states of the universe that are compatible with life. The full conditions for the development of life will be very complicated. It seems to take a long time to evolve intelligence. In fact, it is not clear we have achieved it yet. Thus a necessary condition for intelligent life would be that the universe is expanding at something like the present rate. One could therefore ask for amplitudes for different conformal three geometries on a surface with trace k equal to the present Hubble constant.
However, the hidden face after the end of inflation would have been chaotic and impossible to follow in detail. We therefore consider the quantum amplitudes on an expanding surface in the inflationary period and then evolve to the future using classical laws. We consider a model in which the potential had a local maximum at phi equals zero. The second derivative at the maximum is assumed to be sufficiently low that there is not a Coleman D. Lucia solution that straddles the maximum, but only a constant Hawking mass in Stanton that sits on top of the hill. One now calculates the amplitude or wave function of the universe as a function of k, the second fundamental form, and phi on the surface. <coughs> we first calculate a wave function for real Euclidean k, and then analytically continue to imaginary or Lorentzian k. For small phi and any Euclidean k, there will be a Euclidean O4 symmetric solution of the field equations with the given boundary conditions. This solution will be part of a deformed sphere or Hawking Turek in Stanton. In it, the scalar field will run uphill from the non-singular south pole to the prescribed value of phi on the surface. For k equals zero, the action of this Hawking Turek in Stanton will be more negative than the action of the O5 symmetric Hawking mass in Stanton, in which the scalar field sits at the top of the hill. This would seem to suggest that the universe is least likely to start at the top of the hill. However, one is not interested in a Euclidean spacetime, but in a Lorentzian expanding universe. In this, Euclidean K will be pure imaginary. One therefore has to analytically continue to the imaginary K axis. In the O5 Hawking mass case, the real part of the action is constant on the imaginary axis. However, a perturbation calculation we have done indicates that for the O4 case, the real part of the action increases on the imaginary axis away from k equals zero and becomes more than the O5 action. This indicates that in an inflationary universe, the scalar field is more likely to start at the top of the hill and roll down than to start lower down. The reason is that although being at the top of the hill costs potential energy, it saves gradient energy by having a scalar field that is constant in space and time.
If the top of the hill is fairly flat, the gradient energy is dominant, and the universe starts with a constant scalar at the top of the hill. I did this work, not to revive the new inflation scenario, but because we are interested in trace anomaly driven inflation. This was the first accelerated expansion model to be proposed, predating even the use of the term inflation. It is based on the large N approximation. The standard model of particle physics contains nearly a hundred fields. If as we suspect, the standard model is embedded in a supersymmetric theory, the number of fields would be at least double, and maybe very much higher. Thus the large N approximation should hold in cosmology, even at the origin of the universe. In the large N approximation, one performs the path integral over the matter fields in a given background to obtain an effective action, which is a functional of the background metric. One then argues that the effect of gravitational fluctuations are small in comparison to the large number of matter fluctuations. Thus one can neglect graviton loops and look for a stationary point of the combined gravitational action and the effective action for the matter fields. This is equivalent to solving the Einstein equations with the source being the expectation value of the matter energy momentum tensor. Finally, one can calculate linearized fluctuations about the stationary point metric and check they are small. This is confirmed observationally by measurements of the cosmic microwave background which indicate that the primordial metric fluctuations were of the order of 10 to the minus 5. The large N approximation was first applied to cosmology in the 70s, particularly by the Russians. One of the main motivations was to obtain a model of the universe without an initial singularity. Instead, Grishka Konseldovich proposed that the universe was in a de-sitter phase for an infinite time before exiting to a decelerating expansion. This model was developed in more detail by Starobinsky. He assumed there were a large number of conformally invariant matter fields which would give the energy momentum tensor a trace anomaly that was a known function of the local curvature. In a de-sitter background, the trace-free part of the energy momentum tensor would be zero by symmetry. Thus the energy momentum tensor would be proportional to the metric, and de-sitter space would be a stationary point of the combined action. However, 
transfer. In order to get the universe to exit the desitter phase, Starobinsky had to assume there were also non-conformally invariant matter fields that added a non-conformally invariant local term to the effective action. I must admit I didn't take this Russian model very seriously at the time. This was before we realized the importance of exponential expansion or inflation in solving the fine-tuning problems of the hot Big Bang, like horizons and space curvature. Also, why should the universe have expanded for an infinite time in a desitter phase before becoming unstable and exiting inflation? What was the clock? that told the instability to turn on. However, we can now recognize this initial desitter phase as corresponding to the quantum creation of the universe from nothing, the instant in which was the Euclidean force sphere. Moreover, the ADS-CFT correspondence now provides us with a way of calculating the effective action of matter fields on backgrounds without symmetry. This was not available in the early days, so Starobinsky had to neglect non-local terms in the effective action. I shall therefore reappraise the Starobinsky model in the light of modern knowledge. My talk will be based on joint work with Harvey Real and Thomas Hertog. The ADS-CFT prescription for calculating the effective action on a background metric is performed in Euclidean space, like all good quantum field theory calculations. One takes a four-dimensional metric to be the boundary of a solution of the Einstein equations with a negative cosmological constant in five dimensions. One takes the action of this solution, adds counter terms that depend on the geometry of the boundary, and takes the limit at the ADS length scale and the five-dimensional Newton's constant go to zero. One can now calculate the combined four-dimensional gravitational and matter field effective actions. The only O4 stationary point metrics are flat space and the four sphere. The latter can be regarded as the Euclidean version of a desitter space, where the cosmological constant is provided by the trace anomaly of a large and conformal field theory. These two solutions are the final and initial stages of an inflationary model. However, in order to get a solution that interpolates between the two, one has to add an r squared term to the gravitational action, as Starobinsky discovered. This can be justified as a local counter term in the effective action of non-conformal invariant fields. With this addition, the expansion changes from exponential to matter-dominated in a time scale that depends on the coefficient of the R-squared term.
There are heavy contributions to the combined gravitational and effective matter action, and they are shown on the slide. The combined action is stationary under all perturbations, HIJ, of the metric of the boundary, if the boundary is a force sphere with radius, R, of order n to the half. This corresponds to a D-sitter solution, where the cosmological constant is provided by the trace anomaly of large numbers of matter fields. For large n, the radius of the D-sitter space will be large in Planck units. Thus gravitational fluctuations will be small, confirming the consistency of the large N approximation. One can decompose the perturbations in the Balkan boundary into harmonics under the isometry group O5 of the Euclidean D-sitter solution. The harmonics can be divided into scalar, transverse vector, and transverse raceless tensor. The vector harmonic perturbations are pure gauge, so they don't affect the action. The gauge freedom leads to closed loops of fatty pop of ghosts, but they can be neglected in the large N approximation. <coughs> The scalar part of the perturbed combined action is shown on the slide. One can think of the non-derivative terms in phi as the potential V. The imperturbed D-sitter solution at phi equals zero is at the top of the hill. If alpha is greater than two, the top of the hill is flat enough that the universe is most likely to start at the top. This justifies Starobinsky's trace anomaly model and explains why the universe starts in an unstable D-sitter state. The growth time of the instability will be 12 alpha times the radius of the force sphere. Since alpha is a counter term, there is no reason it should not be quite large. If it is greater than 5, there will be enough inflation to solve the flatness problem. A large alpha will also give scalar fluctuations in the microwave background that are small.
One of the big objections to trace anomaly inflation has been that it has ghosts and classical and quantum instabilities. Ghost poles in the propagator are normally taken to be a fatal flaw in the field theory. The reason is that they seem to indicate that one could have asymptotic ingoing and outgoing states which had negative norm. This would mean that the evolution from the initial state to the final state is not described by a unitary S matrix. Unitarity is usually taken to be an essential property of any respectable field theory. Hertog and I have shown, however, that one can live with higher derivative ghosts. They just mean that one cannot measure all the degrees of freedom, so one doesn't have unitarity. Defining the theory in the Euclidean regime, and then we're rotating to the Lorentzian, implicitly imposes the final boundary condition that the fields remain bounded. This removes the instabilities, like with the classical radiation reaction force. What we can observe are the fluctuations in the microwave background. These can be calculated in the large N theory, even though it has ghosts. The amplitude of the fluctuations will be determined in the initial D sitter stage. If the gravitational action were all that contributed, the amplitude of the tensor fluctuations would be of the order of 1 over horizon size. Since the horizon size will be roughly root n, the tensor fluctuations would be 1 over root n. Starobinsky visited DAMTP in Cambridge in 1980 and took the opportunity of being outside Soviet scientific censorship to publish a remarkable paper in physics letters. In it, he showed how to calculate tensor fluctuations of inflationary models before the term inflation had even been applied to the early universe. Starobinsky concluded that the trace anomaly inflationary model had to be abandoned because it would require 10 to the 10 matter fields to reduce the tensor fluctuations to the observational limit.
Mr. Rabinsky assumed that the amplitude of the tensor fluctuations was not significantly changed by the coupling to the matter effective action. However, this assumption can now be examined using ads CFT. It turns out that matter loops can greatly reduce the fluctuations so that they can be compatible with the observations with only a realistic number of matter fields. For example, one can have n equals 10 to the 4 and beta equals 10 to the 3. The large N trace anomaly inflationary model requires tuning of the counter terms, alpha and beta, to fit the observations. But then, any other explanation of the microwave fluctuations also involves tuning. No one can predict an amplitude of 10 to the minus 5 in a natural way. Maybe we have to resort to the anthropic principle. To summarize, Hertog and I have shown that one doesn't need an initial hot stage to explain why inflation began at a local maximum of the potential. If the curvature of the potential at the maximum is sufficiently low, a constant Hawking mass type field at the maximum will have lower energy than an inhomogeneous Coleman D. Lucia type field. This makes it favorable for inflation to start at the top of the hill in a de-sitter state. Quantum fluctuations will then disturb the scalar field and cause it to run down the hill. This scenario is realized in the trace anomaly model in which inflation is driven by the quantum effective action of a large number of matter fields. The effective action can be calculated using ADS, CFT. In the Euclidean regime, one has a ball of five-dimensional ADS bounded by a four-dimensional sphere representing the de-sitter face of our universe. This could well be described as the universe in a nutshell. Thank you for listening. Uh, Stephen is willing to take uh, a few questions. To match the microwave background fluctuation, alpha has to be very big. Doesn't then um, the R square term completely dominate the uh, trace anomaly term and make the trace anomaly term less important or less dominant? I don't think alpha has to be that large, but why not? It is a free parameter. I admit it is tuning, but how are you going to get 10 to 
to the minus 5 without tuning. Well, let's thank Stephen.